that big blunt pipe on it. Yeah, turn it sideways like that. There, that's much better. Good evening. Hey, Sean. Montana. I'm sure, you, I'm sure you've heard Clark was selling to civilians again. I bet everyone who paid scalper prices for Colts feels stupid now. <laughs> no. I don't know that I necessarily feel stupid. It's just, it looks so, well, like, it was, really uh, bad. It was, you know, Colt, uh, they created a stir by making a, a stupid announcement. That was a, it was dumb for them to make any announcement. That they, were, they were halting any production. They should have just took care of their government contracts quietly and told their distributors that uh, we're a bit overwhelmed at the moment. Uh, they would have saved all the disruptions and all the, you know, the new haters they've got now. Um, not to mention all the people who did have to who did spend all that extra money because they thought there was going to be no more cold suits. Uh, I would be mad at the company yeah. for saying something like that. And because they looked at it as their opportunity to get a, you yeah. know, if they didn't have a cult, they would have like, to... to sell all their inventory immediately at a top price. God, that is really, that's low. Give it a few more seconds and then we're going to get started. We do have some hey, Brent, submitted questions from earlier. Hey, Brent, I'm sure you enjoyed those nice pictures from this upcoming LMG video. I think our buddy Alex really liked to see that, uh, that LMG sing too. Okay, we're going to jump in. Um, uh, if you guys are new to the channel in our Q&As, um, first and foremost, because that always gets asked, do you need to pay um, into the Super Chat to uh, submit a question? Absolutely not. Most of our questions that we read out are uh, unpaid questions. We try to get through as many as possible. Um, if you do donate uh, during the chat, you get priority over all the other questions, and uh, yours gets pulled first. Um, donor box is our preferred method of donations. Um, you can put your question in the comment section of your donation that can be found on smallarmsolutions.com. Okay, that's an easy link to just click on. And um, my phone's here. I'll get an email. It will skirt the line of questioning. You can also donate with the super chat if you'd like. Uh, Google does take 30%, however, though. So but uh, we'll get through as many questions as possible. I do try to stay in order um, and go up to the top. So don't feel discouraged if you feel like I've missed your question. And because so much is coming in, I do still roll up to the very beginning and, and pull questions. So uh, first one is on donor box um, from Katie. He wants to know, I'm buying another 762 by 51 semi-auto rifle. Out of these three, what do you think is the best and why? Price doesn't matter to me. SCAR 17, LMT, MOK. So, M O K isn't that supposed yeah, to be like? okay? Yes. Okay, Mars H or an H and K M R seven six two. Well, uh, I have all those, uh, all three of them, and I have to say, if I could only have one, it would be the L M T. And my reason is the sheer about the sheer amount of uh, things that it can do: uh, changing barrels, changing barrel lengths, changing calibers the modularity of the LMT just offers you something that none of those other ones do. The degree of precision, uh, 
the, the Scar the Scar Seventeen S, unless you're getting the, the the match grade one, is basically an assault rifle type. It's not uh, more. It's not much of a precision type rifle. It's far more of a assault rifle type. The HK. You're paying a hell of a lot of money for something that does not have the capabilities of the LMT, uh, and you're paying a lot of money, a lot of, of money for that name. Uh, it's just really a hard pill to swallow to to drop three or four, you know, three grand on a rifle that you can't change out the barrel. The barrel that you have is the only barrel you're going to get. Um, the LMT, if you want to use that 308 as a SBR an assault rifle, you can get yourself a 13 and a half inch chrome plated combat barrel. You want to turn it into a DMR, 18-inch stainless steel or 20-inch stainless steel. You want it to a, a, a mid-length type of assault rifle, you have yourself a 16-inch or the 18-inch. Um, you want to go for long-distance attack uh, driving, you put your 20 or your 24-inch 6.5 Creedmoor barrel on it. You just have uh, such a vast amount more you can do with that LMT versus those other two. Uh, Steve on DonorBox. Thank you, Steve. Any thoughts on BCGs offered by Forward Control Design? Forward Control Design, uh, he does a beautiful job. Uh, he just really does a beautiful job. Um, I have not had a chance to really take a look at one. In fact, I'm supposed to be having him send me one, uh, some other of his parts to take a look at. So far as I know, his biggest difference that he does is going to be in, um, in, in the finish that he puts on it. And he has a couple of little extra things on there for like a groove for pushing forward with your thumb on the, you know, to close the bolt like a forward assist. Um, it doesn't really stand out as a reliability enhancement, you know, like the LMT bolt carrier does, or even like some of the other ones do. I think it's a much more advanced type of a uh, feel. Um, and and so forth. I don't know. I haven't had haven't had one in front of me yet. I'm waiting to get my hands on one that could probably give you a lot more of a uh, assessment after I see it. Uh, Kirk on Donor Box. He just wants to say um, Happy Independence Day. He's well, thank off, you. He's off to Long Beach on Lake Mich Michigan for a weekend of sailing, grilling, and shooting. And he says uh, he wanted to wish his best to everyone. Thank you. Um, and that that's uh, how Yankees say y'all. Well, living in New York for ten years, it's you know, they they say you all. Mm -hmm. Or use. Oh, God. That's more of an Italian thing. Uh, Patrick on DaughterBox. Thank you so much, Patrick. No, he had, didn't have a question. Rory on DaughterBox. What would you think about calling on LWRCDI bolt carrier with an LMT enhanced bolt being the best bolt carrier assembly out there? Would you know where to get LMT parts for some sort of reasonable price? We get that question a lot. You wouldn't believe what he lists an enhanced bolt carrier for on his website. Well, it is it, it, your your biggest cost is the enhanced bolt. The enhanced bolt is a, significantly more expensive to manufacture because of the materials uh, and the additional parts. The interesting thing about the carriers is you have certain aspects of the LMT which are awesome, and then you have the one aspect of the LWRC, which has the, you know, the integral uh, carrier key, which is incredible. For the most part, on a standard rifle, uh, I think you would be excellent to go with the uh, LWRC carrier and an, an LMT bolt. There's there's no question. Uh, if you were to use a 14 and a half inch barrel with a, a carbine length gas system, I probably would say you're better off going with the LMT, but using a 16 inch, um, I certainly would say you have an awesome combination right there. For as far as parts are concerned, uh, LMT is working on parts. They're running three. They're running three shifts. Last I knew, um, they're in the middle of some military contracts as well. And some of the parts that are in demand, such as enhanced bolts and things like that, those are part of some of the contract that they're doing. So there, uh, there's not a lot available at the moment. Uh, I expect you, you will see in the future uh, a lot more stuff coming available. But uh, for as far as the prices are concerned, you know his prices really are up to par with everybody else's. And you're getting a hell of a lot more bolts than the enhanced bolts. There's no question it's going to be a lot more expensive than a standard bolt. You know, the not only is the material more expensive, the tools that cut it, you know, those tools don't last nearly as long because of the stronger materials. And you're not using mill spec parts that you know you can buy from anybody. These are uh, LMT has to have you know, specific extractors made, bolts, um, and, and so on and so forth. It's a it's a whole different animal than the, than the standard mill spec one. Okay, so we're going to start going into the chat. All those submitted questions are done, um, and we'll start pulling them. And um, up at the top, we have one um, wanting to know your thoughts on 6 millimeter ARC. Um, I have uh, ammunition on the way, and I'm waiting right now to get a rifle. I was talking to the rep I deal with at CMMG. Uh, they're working on one at the moment, uh, so I'm hoping to be getting a rifle from them. 
Um, but you can guarantee as soon as I get my hands on one, you will see a video. Um, I ordered a few different guinds of rounds from Hornady, but uh, that's a little bit scarce right now. So I'm not quite sure how long it's going to take to get it. Thoughts on shooting a 40 out of a Glock 20 or 29 for cheaper range work? Uh, no, uh, a 10 millimeter is a 10 millimeter, 40 caliber is a 40 caliber. Uh, they had those guns, uh, the head space on the, on the, on the end of the case mouth, uh, you start putting in a 40 caliber into a, uh, 10 millimeter, <laughs> you, 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 you're, the cartridge case isn't supported by anything other than the extractor. That is not a safe thing to do. Uh, Lex wants you to know, thank you for your wealth of knowledge. You're a treasure. I appreciate that. <laughs> he, he never hears that at home. So I'm sure he appreciates hearing that. Um, I actually have a funny story attached to this too. It's quick. I didn't tell you about this, Chris. We had a new, um, first of all, the question from Michael wants to know, we've answered this a few times or Chris has answered this before thoughts on the, what would stoner do project from in range? He, <laughs> which I'm, he'll answer for you in just a moment, but we got a new Patreon um, a few days ago. Um, and I think his name was Ivan. Um, I don't know how I remember that, but um, he messaged and said um, that he became a Patreon because he was watching their video on that. And it made him think of you because of how you don't like it. <laughs> it's not a matter of not liking it. It's what they're showing is the exact opposite of what Stoner would have done. Stoner did not like 5.56. He did not like 5.56, period. Uh, in fact, when it came to uh, having to scale down his AR-10 to the AR-15, he had his engineers do it. Um, it was a last-ditch effort, so he would be able to do something for our U.S. government contract. When he came out of retirement, basically, to work with Reed Knight, the first thing he did was he did his AR-10 as the SR-25. His primary interest was always... And I mean, always in 7.62 rifles. So, for as far as making a, a lightweight rifle out of polymer like that, I don't, I don't believe that's what he would have done at all. Um, you know, perhaps that was just because he was working. They were working with several companies, and that's what they had. I, I don't know. Um, Stoner did not work um, in those kind of, under those circumstances. Uh, his his real thing he he wanted to do was 308. Um, you know, you take anything, they make it lightweight and. Uh, is what Stoner would do. I don't know. But to me, everything I know about the man, what would Stoner do? He would have made a lighter weight uh, rifle in chambered in 7.16 NATO. Do they still make federal 9mm Hydroshock deep? They do. They have a new one. Uh, hold on a second. Let me grab it. I don't know the name. They get to see your orange shorts. They look like prison shorts. <laughs> And while we're waiting for Chris to yes, pull that item, um, everybody hit the, the like button. Apparently, there's already a dislike on it. Okay, here we go. It goes above and beyond to answer your question. Now, the new round is what they refer to as the Hydroshock Deep. Uh, this was just put out maybe maybe a couple years ago. Hornady had pretty much stopped doing most of. Sorry, uh, Federal pretty much stopped doing the Hydroshock with the with the you know the addition of the HST round. Now the having the little tit in the middle of the projectile did do quite a bit for as far as speeding up the expansion process. By having that in there, any kind of fluid would circulate, would speed up the expansion process. So it would speed up more than that of the uh, HST. So what they're calling it now is the Hydroshock Deep, uh, which is basically a enhanced Hydroshock. And they do have them in 940 and 45. Everybody agrees that those were Texas correction <laughs> shorts. I know we don't uh, wear shorts. I just, uh, that was just it's hotter than hell here in Texas. So yeah, it's, it, we're, we're at that part in the summertime where you walk outside and you feel like you're, you're, you're cooking literally in, the, in an oven and you can't even breathe because the, the air is so thick. Yeah, somebody else asked about the fact that they were surprised to see Texas has a mask mandate. So if you can imagine, like, in that heat with that mask, it's nobody hates it more than Chris. Mm -hmm. uh, Tad on Daughterbox, thank you, Tad. He said, uh, so last weekend I walked into a gun store intent on buying an AR-15 and walked out with a Henry Lever Action Big Boy and 357 Magnum. I did it because the cheapest AR they had uh, was an FN basic AR-15 for over a thousand dollars. 
and my lever mm -hmm. rifle was nearly $200 cheaper. Anyway, is the FN Basic AR-15 really worth it? Because according to what I've read online, you're better off with a Ruger or Smith & Wesson for such a basic rifle for hundreds of dollars less. And yes, I am a red-blooded man from Utah. I'd be dishonoring my American heritage to not have lever action rifle. And happy Independence Day. Thank you. Well, I'm the wrong guy to talk to about lever actions. Uh, I, I'm pretty much, I only deal with, with modern military type stuff. Now, for as far as the cost is concerned, a thousand dollars for a, ba a base is not a bad price at all for an FN. So, uh, if you were finding an FN base model for around a thousand to twelve hundred, that was a good price. Um, I considered FN probably a higher quality rifle than the Smith and Wesson or the Ruger. Um, you know, FN has a lot more experience in manufacturing that type of a rifle than either the other two. Um, I have tested both the Smith and Wesson and the Ruger. Um, Ruger wasn't noteworthy at all. The Smith and Wesson, you know, it, it was basic. Uh, I got one right behind me. Uh, we're doing a video coming up on, uh, you know, budget ARs, buying ARs on a budget. We're going over probably seven or so rifles that are, you know, going to be around the six, seven hundred dollar mark, and uh, you know, that's that's one of them. You know, um, but quite frankly, if you were looking at an FN for a thousand or twelve hundred in area in there, I think you're doing pretty good. Yeah, we did do filming today. If you guys are on our Patreon, I shared a photo of us, um, a funny. picture of Chris when he was filming uh, with us. And it was no, that was the one for Centurion. Yes. Um, and then we <laughs> we filmed a new crime, crime series, series. Yeah. Larson L nine millimeter, which I'm I. I I might do just like a couple of seconds of outtakes at the very end of it. She was laughing. Normally when we do these videos, she does not laugh. Uh, uh, well, when he started off the video, it's like, um, this is like part six of the crime series, the Lorsen. It's like the highest level of crap that's crap ever seen or something like that. And I just like, I literally like choked my camera. Those of you who are on our, 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 uh, our webpage, um, our web page and, and our uh, Instagram and all that. We posted a picture of a target where bullets hit sideways. This was the gun. This Larson L9 millimeter. This was the gun that the bullets were keyholing. So yeah, that was a. This thing's a real, real gem. Yeah, I posted. Um, yeah. So on Instagram, there's the photo of the target where the sideways bullets. Um, <laughs> Patreon got a nice photo of you with the Centurion, um, and then on Facebook they got the picture of you. Like his eyes are red. I mean, he was literally like choking because he was laughing so hard. So was I over the yeah, highest parts, level. Parts of crap. Flying and oh, yeah, that's why I s might do outtakes because it really was, it was an interesting filming session because he went to take that gun apart. And, and like, I, I'm lucky he didn't like, yeah, she's lucky he didn't hit get me. <laughs> and he couldn't find the part. And it was, yeah. It was an interesting filming day. And then I was pretty sure at some point he was going to walk down the street with his a rifle and chase off the lawn people because they were literally using that blower for like two hours. Straight. They just wouldn't stop. I mean, right, right by our window to this entire street, they have to be in front of this house. <laughs> Thoughts on the CMC straight trigger. You know, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, I've never used them. Even though CMC is here in Texas, um, I did make a phone call maybe a year or two ago trying to get some samples to take a look at, and uh, they were never responsive to me, so I never really had taken a look at them. You know, for as far as triggers, I have I have my staples. Um, I, I like Geisley. I like uh, Hipper Fire. Uh, and quite frankly, Monty LeClaire on Centurion has got some new triggers out now, too. He's got a beautiful two-stage trigger that's probably half the cost. I forget what the cost, but it's at least half the cost of that of a Geisley, uh, and it's an excellent trigger. Uh, so there's a lot better options that are out there. Um, I tend to like the curb triggers myself. I don't tend, tend to go for the straight ones, but uh, they all pretty much everybody offers uh, many, many different configurations. They do love leaf blowers in Texas everywhere. It really, it really was. It was comical hour. today. It was like an hour and a half of just constant. And and so we'd have to, forth. we'd have to stop. And the guy was literally walking down the street with these, these leaves, and we were like, oh, "He's got to be done." So right? he was doing the yard in front of us, and the one on each, yeah, side and then of the one street. on each side. And so then I swear, and you know, these houses are always so close together. <laughs> it was. He was getting mad. I'm having a hard time uh, between the BCM Recce and the Centurion AR-15. Is there any major advantage one has over the other? Mike LeClaire makes a lot of his own parts. 
uh, VCM, they make a great, they make great guns. Uh, they farm a lot of their stuff out. Monty is just a, he is a whole different type of pe type of people. You are looking at somebody who has carried these guns in combat, who has had who has had the experience to look at and see what he thinks is the best, and then to take it and make additions that he would want on his rifle, which he did carry. Um, you know, I have one of Monty's recce rifles, and you're going to see that in the video coming up uh, on, on the fourth. And you're going to see that rifle. And you're going to see how incredible that it was. Um, the attention to detail that he did. Uh, he made that rifle just like it was supposed to be, you know, the heavy barrel, the chamber that's specifically set up for the Mark 262 round, um, the pinned on gas block, you know, all those things that that would make a true military grade rifle. Now I can't say anything bad about BCM. Um, I've been trying to get some more BCM rifles for review. I talked to Eric uh, right, right around the time Corona started and he said basically that, uh, you know, they can't make enough guns for sale right now. So hopefully at some point uh, we'll be able to get some more BCM guns here. But I got to tell you, um, everything that comes out of Centurion Arms is military grade. It's literally stuff that if you had to walk into one of those riots tomorrow to protect yourself, you'd be able to take any of those rifles, whether it be his uh, Mark 12, Mod 1, his recce rifle, or his lightweight. Um, whether it be any one of those three, um, you're getting the best of everything. You're getting coal hammer forged barrels for the combat rifles. You're getting a stainless steel match for the uh, recce. You're getting the Douglas type barrel for the, for the, for the Mark 12. Uh, you're getting a drill and pin gas block, so we know those aren't going to come. That's not going to come loose and cut my get cut the gas off at an inopportune time. Um, it's military grade um, bolt carriers and bolts that are that are all that are all mill spec uh, that have the rubber O rings. Every single part that he does, he does for a reason, uh, and that's 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 very hard to ignore. And you may want to wait and make your decision after you see our new video on Centurion, which um, I will be working all day tomorrow to get finished so that you guys, while you are celebrating America on Saturday, you know, there's nothing more American than guns. Mm -hmm. So uh, that'll go up on Saturday and we do have some codes for Centurion. I'll pop those in the chat right now. And um, if you are looking at that, there's three separate codes for three different categories. Henry's in the house for nine hole review. Hey, Henry. John on Donor Box. Thank you, John. He said he just bought an FN high power. It's from around 1955 to 1956. It was an Austrian police issue with a holster, and it is, it, it's not super clean. I want to get it modified and carry it. Should I not? Because it might be collectible. I could sell it and buy a newer high power as I'm not a collector. That does not have a firing pin safety on it. I would not be using that as a carry gun. Um, that is the most basic thing that you want in a, sem a semi-automatic pistol for a safe carry is a firing pin safety. So if that gun is to be dropped, it's not going to go off from the inertia of the firing pin setting it off. So uh, that gun has no decocker on it. So you're going to have to, if you have a Rama chamber, you're going to have to manually lower the, uh, the, the, the hammer by hand, which is not necessarily safe. But first and foremost, there's no firing pin safety. So I would not recommend you use that as a carry gun. There are too many other options that are safe. Guns that you can throw up against a wall and they still won't go off. That's more, I think, of a collector's item. Adam, thank you. Any insider uh, insights as to whether I should be stocking up on pistol braces? Would they be banned outright, grandfathered, or no more shouldering? I have no idea. Uh, ATF's making some of the stuff up as they go. Um, you know, coming from somebody who worked in law enforcement and uh, in forensics, you know, we always, you know, Definitions are, are how we do things. I mean, the definition of fully automatic is, you know, you continues to pull, continues to fire until either you run out of ammunition or the trigger is released. That's fully automatic fire. Uh, and now you're, redes you're redesignating it for uh, rate of fire for as far as like, uh, you know, you know the, the 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 sliding stocks. What the hell are they called in the brains of organ? I don't know why you're looking at me. I'm not yeah. going to be able to answer that for you. <laughs> You know, they're making up things as they go. Uh, and the problem with that is, which what's legal today is, is not legal tomorrow. Um, I have no idea what's going through their head, what they're thinking, uh, what's going to happen. Um, you know, it, it tends to be stocking up on things. That's really a gamble, uh, whether it's going to be Somebody grandfathered or not. Plump stock. That's plump stock, yes. You know, I guess it depends on how much disposable income that you have, whether you really want to tie it up with a risk of that. You know, if they decide they're going to do like with the bump stocks and make everything just done right illegal, you don't want to be stuck with, you know, a whole, a whole bunch of that stuff. 
it, it's really how you want to spend your money, dude. And if, if it was my money, I put it on something I know that they're, that, uh, well, <laughs> anything can be banned these days, but uh, something that we have a little bit more, we're a little more sure about. Hmm. David, thank you. You said good evening. You too. Hope you have a happy Independence Day. Same thank to you. Thank you very much. Adnan wants to know about yeah. Mark Westrom of Armalite, since he basically invented the mid-length gas system, but it seems like nobody gives him credit. Do people in the industry even know that he invented that system? Well, what a lot of people will look at is uh, Colt had a, 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 a mid-length system back in the 60s. It was something they spent very little time on. There was something they had. It was never proven. Mark Westrom, well, there's a lot of people out there who don't get credit for what they do. Um, and Mark has not gotten the credit that's due to him for that, for the uh, mid-length gas system. It's the same thing with Dick Swan. Dick Swan was the one who developed the final uh, dimensions for the 1913 rail. There's a lot of people that get lost in history as to where stuff comes from. Um, Mark Westrom's contributed a lot to this industry uh, because you, know, you look at a former ordinance officer who was out at Rock Island. Um, he's done a lot of stuff that uh, people don't know about. And just like Jeff Hoffman at Black Hills, you have no idea the kind of contributions that this guy had. There's so many uh, unsung heroes, if you want to call it that, um, in the industry. But uh, there is no question that the modern mid-length system Mark Westrom is definitely the father of. He is the one who brought it out. He's the one that's pushed it. And it took 20 years for SOCOM to actually test it and say, yeah, this is better. We, this, this, this is a major enhancement over the carbulent gas system, which Mark has been saying all along. Um, and sometimes it just takes a long time for shit to actually uh, get accepted. Um, and the Midland gas system was one of them. And now, I mean, I've told you guys many times, the best barrel I think is a cold hammer forge mid-length 16-inch barrel. Uh, that's the ideal uh, barrel length as far as I'm concerned, an ideal gas system for the reliability enhancement for better extraction. Brian on Donnerbox. Thank you, Brian. Thoughts on the M4A1 Block 2 rifle versus the Geisley URGI? A lot of what it comes down to is, uh, is, is, is handguard styles. You know, um, I guess I look at the day on the fence versus the uh, Geisley. Certainly, I think the Geisley probably makes a, a better system, but both of them are free-floated. Uh, both of them do the same job. Which one's better mechanically? They're, you know, they both are free floating, so I, I can't see one any better than the other. But what it comes down to is, you know, which one they can add more gadgets to, uh, which one meets their requirement. You know, a lot of stuff comes down to personal preference. You know, mechanics is one thing. Both of them are free floating barrels. You're good to go. Uh, but then it comes down to your personal preference. Which one do you like better? Resolute. Does copper brass cause pitting in barrel? No, generally what causes pitting in barrels is corrosion and fire cutting uh, over time. Um, you, you know, if you, what really damages barrels is steel, steel cartridge cases. I'm um, sorry, steel or bimetal bullets. That's more apt to damage a bolt than anything in copper. But eventually, with with uh, you know with firearms, you do get pitting in barrels from from corrosion and from uh, fire cutting and lack of maintenance, lack, lack of proper maintenance. Like you live down here in Texas, you don't maintain your, your barrels, uh, you leave them out in the humidity, um, and eventually you're going to get corrosion in there. It's going to cause uh, an, an autoloader failure to extract and so forth. Same thing happened in Vietnam with the M16s over there. Uh, humidity is a killer to anything metal. Are you going to be reviewing any of the Sons of Liberty Gunworks 308 rifles? Um. It's not one that's been on the list, but it certainly could. Um, it's something that certainly we'll, we'll be looking into. Uh, we have a lot of good stuff right now. I got a, I got a, a good a good size amount of things that are stacked up right now to do some new videos on. So we can just get the leaf blower guy away. Yeah, from I'm, I, I'm, I'm set for for a couple months here. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm trying to get Henry to go out to do some shooting with me. I need I need his expertise. That human, those hawk eyes of his, and that uh, human like vice uh, capabilities he has to go test out some precision rifles. Uh, Henry. Chris, Christopher on uh, DonorBox. <clears throat> Thank you, Christopher. I found your video on AR-15 buffer selection extremely helpful and have recommended it many times to friends who have had questions about what buffer to use. But when asked about an AR-10 SR-25 DPMS 308 buffer system, I have been unable to find a similar video on the topic from you. Would you be able to do a quick rundown on the buffers available for AR-10s for me and consider publishing a companion video on this in the future? There's not really much to say because it's, it's not nearly as complex. You basically have three buffers for a 308. You have a the fixed stock, which is uh, slightly shorter than that of a standard AR-15. 
And then you have a what you would refer to as a military grade buffer, which is a longer receiver extension that uses a standard uh, M4 type buffer, normally an H3 buffer. Or you use a commercial, which is a, a standard M4 receiver extension, where you have to use a shorter, um, a shorter uh, buffer. Now, the best way to go is always with the extended military, where you're using a standard M4 type H3 buffer. And if you look at any of the military grade guns, LMT, Knights, um, LWRC, they are all using uh, the military type uh, receiver extensions, which are longer and take the longer buffer. So the reality is if you're using a 308, you want to use the 308 uh, buffer some, or 308 receiver extension, which uses an M4 type buffer and generally an H3. That's really, it's, it's not really that complicated. If you use the commercial, if you were to look at any of these commercially and you were to put them on a high-speed video and these little ones that had the two weights in them, you will physically be able to see that bolt carrier bounce back uh, before it settles. You will be able to physically see it. Um, and because these aren't used in fully automatic, it generally doesn't matter as much. But to have a properly timed rifle, you want to have a H3 buffer with the proper uh, extension. What are your thoughts on in-range TV's mud tests? <laughs> um, <laughs> I could answer this question. <laughs> there is a couple things uh, over the last couple weeks I've watched, and it just blows my mind. You know, when you see temperature tests, and I see these mud tests, and so on and so forth, there is a reason why the military has standards for this. There is a, re for instance, the temperature test. There is a there's an 800 page document that that NATO has for standards for testing equipment um, under very and under various environmental conditions, and what they will do is, for instance, when we'll say cold, we'll look at uh, the world divided up into three categories. You have this 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 region is going to have you know up to negative 20. This region is going to have negative 40, and the coldest regions in the in the world be negative 60. So they're going to say negative 60 is our threshold. We go to look at, you know, we're doing our testing for, uh, for, for salt spray, you know, so we're going to look at the condition of the ocean. What is the concentricity of salt in, the, in that water? And then they're going to make their test versus that mud. We're going to look at mud throughout the world and we're going to find out a specific viscosity of what mud and what kind of dirt that it is. Same thing with sand. You have a certain type of sand viscosity that's used for that testing. What you're seeing on a lot of these are people who are just, we're just going to mix up mud and we're going to do it. And it's more for entertainment value than it is for real world. Um, I saw, I believe it was a, a video that was done by the farmer's blog where he froze uh, an AK and he froze uh, an AR-15. And <laughs> you know, he declared the AK the winner because the AR he had, it went click. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't fire. Then he come to find out that uh, the, you know, the, the firing pin wouldn't protrude. Well, the reality was the gun that he had was not a U.S. M4. It was a, it was a parts gun. Now, when you're doing these kinds of tests, I have seen multiple tests, especially at cold, where you would have you would come right out of those negative 60-degree uh, environmental chambers and fire. That never happened. So when you're looking at rifles that are not built to the military standard with using parts, God knows where they come from, that's not a good example of how this weapon really performs. And a lot of these tests... They're not, they're, the military does them for a reason. And it's, you know, and once you understand it, it makes total sense. None of these things are at random. They deliberately talk about different places on the planet where these guns will be. And that's what they want to test them to, whether it's cold, heat, whether it's, uh, you know, doing a shock test where you have something that's frozen and then it goes out into the heat or vice versa uh, with condensation and all that. It's all based off of real world scenarios. So a lot of stuff that, you know, that in range does an Iraq veteran with the destruction testing, you really have to take with a grain of salt is it's entertainment. It's not scientific. Um, when you look at a lot of stuff that, uh, that Iraq veteran does with his, with his destruction testing and, and so on and so forth, he's looking at multiple different kinds of ARs, all different kinds of barrels, all different quality of components. And you're seeing all over the place, you're seeing how things fail all over the place. Where if you were to say, we want to talk about the real quality or the real M4 carbine, well, I can tell you an M4 carbine due to its military specs that I can tell you within 10 rounds of where a barrel is going to fail. An M4 barrel of 14 and a half inches is going to go around uh, around 500 rounds, 450 rounds, sorry, 450 rounds. A SOCOM barrel is going to last around 900 rounds before you start having bar uh, barrel failures. That's consistently where you're looking at... Uh, you know, he's, he's got all different barrels, gas tubes that are failing and so, you know, before the barrels. 
any carbine, a military M4 carbine, the barrel will fail before the gas tube, not the other way around. So you're seeing stuff that's made to all different specifications. That's not representing the, the true M16 or M4 of the U.S. military and, and what it's capable of doing in this, in this testing. That's probably more than you wanted to know, but <laughs> it's something that I've been spending a lot of time on, and I, and I always shake my head because a lot of times you're getting the wrong information. Adam, thank you. Are uh, I never can say this right? Criterion, criterion, criterion barrels. Uh, are they all that's cracked up to be? Um, and if so, chrome or nitride? Any thoughts on Lancer carbon fiber handguards? And thank you. Um, I have only used one Criterion barrel, and I'm trying to remember which gun it was. Let me tell you which gun it was, because it was a uh, it was very recent, and it was the only company that I've ever uh, I've ever used one. That was on a recent. It was that one that uh, the guy wanted us to give him the video for free. Ah, American Defense <laughs> UIC. Uh, the American Defense UIC Mod Two. Uh, that is the only Criterion barrel I had. It was accurate. I, you know, I can't say that it. it was any more or less than anything else that I've seen that are quality barrels, but it was certainly a good barrel, you know, for as far as uh, nitride versus chrome. This is where you get into the mil spec versus not. For as far as I know, and still to this day, you, a military gun throughout most of the world is going to be hard chrome plated. Uh, three times harder, three to four times harder than regular barrel steel. It still seems to be the standard. You're seeing the uh, the nitride is, is more of a commercial thing still. Um, I know they've tried to move it more towards military, but for the most part, you're only seeing commercial grade uh, uh, you know barrels are using that. So which ones are? I don't know because I haven't driven any of the uh, you know the nitride barrels to the same level that we have uh, the, the chrome plating. And for some reason, there really hasn't been any tests, at least no tests that I've seen. They really compared the two of them. Uh, if you look at Caracal USA, for instance, Caracal in uh, UAE, everything that they make is cold hammer forged and it is chrome plated uh, manganese phosphate. All their military guns over here, you're seeing the guns that are being put out in, nit in, in their nitride. And you talk to the engineer here, he says he believes that it's just as good. Um, but still, the guns they're making for military contracts have to be chrome plated. So that's really the best I can tell you is it's still the go to barrel is still uh, chrome plated. Matt wants to know, thoughts on Remington bankruptcy and the Na Napaho buy? Uh, the Navajo buy, I'm not, I don't know about, but for as far as Remington is concerned, again, you're looking at a company who's done a lot of stupid things. Uh, you look at the, the sheer rush right now in ARs, and they basically have tied the hands of Bushmaster and DPMS, two major companies who they basically have shut down uh, in a time where they could be making a lot of money. So you make a lot of stupid decisions like that. That's what happens. Uh, yeah, I, th I think it would happen with Bushmaster, you know, with the ACR and all these different kinds of things. You know, um, Remington has not done a very good job at running those companies. And you're going to make those kind of mistakes. It's going it's to come back to bite you, which is, I think, exactly what it has. Uh, it doesn't surprise me one bit. Remington lost the contracts. Uh, they had that contract for the M4, and then they I found out they did include the price for uh, Colts royalties, and they was challenged. And then when uh, the, the bid was redone, they lost it again. So they've missed the, 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 uh, the boat on a lot of important issues and they've lost a lot of money out of stupidity. Jack wants to know, um, what is your opinion on fight light MCR and a saw application? Um, that to, 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 to my knowledge still is not any kind of a, is it's more of a commercial grade weapon. It's not something that has been, uh, put to any military use. Now, the first thing about that is it's closed bolt. Uh, anytime you, you work with a, uh, belt fed you want it to be an open bolt gun uh that's that's for safety reasons um i've, I've used one on, a, on an occasion i've been trying to get one as a t and e to do some messing around with but i still view that as a commercial product not as a uh, as a military grade product will all rifles explode if not drained of water this is a little more complicated depending on the type of a rifle what really hurts the 5.56 is you have a small barrel. Water does not drain out the same way it does with the 30 caliber. 
And that's where uh, if you have water in the board, it can become a more obstruction and cause it to explode where a larger 30 caliber, you don't have it as much. Also, you have the issue with the internal piston, uh, the way the water will clog inside of, inside of the barrel, which is why you don't generally have that problem with the external pistons. But anytime you have a obstruction, uh, in, you will it will cause a rifle to explode. For instance, you fire most rifles underwater. Yeah, that thing's probably going to explode. Uh, that's a lot of pressure underneath there. But uh, it's a little more complex when you're talking about 5.56 five, ARs versus external pistons. But anytime that you get uh, a small barrel like that, water just doesn't run out. And quite frankly, with, a, with the DI guns or the internal piston guns, all you have to do is break the seal on the, uh, on the bolt. And then a little bit of water runs out and it's, it's good to go. It's when you don't have that seal broken where you're asking for problems. I just bought a PWS Mark Mark one one six mod two, and I'm torn between optics, the EO Tech with magnifier, or VCOG or LCAM. I have one of those being delivered next week. I have four guns from from them coming. Can you go back to that list, please? Yes. EO Tech with magnifier, VCOG or LCAM. Well, of those three, again, I have all three of those. VCOG. Uh, I think the VCOG is probably one of the best military scopes that's out there. Um, I think that uh, by dialing all the way down to, to one, you have uh, red dot capability, and you can boost it up to four. Um, you know the you know the EOTEX with the magnifiers are all well and good. It's two, it's two pieces. Um, you're relying on that battery. Uh, you don't you, you tend not to have uh, any kind of fiber optics or anything with it. It's two pieces. Uh, when you can have a one piece that does everything, I tend to like that. The Elkan, excellent optic. It's just so damn expensive. It costs more than your gun does. Um, unless you have a lot of disposable income, that wouldn't really be, I, I wouldn't see any benefit to that over buying the VCOG. Can't think of a better person to ask, but if one was looking to get into an LMT versus an SR. I, I have a, a LMT in 6.5 Creedmoor. In fact, me and Brandon from the gun room, uh, we were out uh, on, Friday, on Monday. And he was, uh, I think, just over a half inch at 100 yards with a Hornady 147 ring um, ELDX match. It's a, it, it was a, it was a tack driver. Now, for as far as the Knights is concerned, I've never used one of theirs in six eight. Or, I'm sorry, in six five. Um, they did recently deliver a, a whole, you know a handful of M 110s to the Army, chambered in six five Creedmoor. Um, yeah, I still say this. You know, it's it's a, I always say the same thing. You know, Knights makes awesome, awesome equipment. For the cost, it's hard to look at an LMT and not to see all the capabilities that the LMT can offer and pay that same price for for the Knights. It's, it, it, it's, it's often very, very hard, I think, to, for me to justify that as much as I would like to. You know, I don't own an SR-25. I have my original one that I got in 1995 from Gene Stoner. I've never been able to justify spending the money on a newer SR-25 when I look at my LMT and it's like, what can this do that this one can't? And I look at the LMT and say, well... I'm I'm putting on SBR and just I can go to 13 and a half inch barrel. I can put a 16 inch combat barrel on. Again, I can put a match grade uh, 18, 20 inch, or I can switch over to four other, five other, other calibers. Which goes back to um, James from earlier in the chat when you were answering a question. He was saying how um, LMT basically owes you at least the gear you use for the channel because of how you promote them and how much money you drop. Well, the re reality is, is I'm, I'm not on Carl's payroll. Uh, he doesn't give me free guns. Any of us, no matter whether it's guns, cars, whatever, we have the product that we think is the best that's out there. We have our opinion on what the best gear is. And I'm not bought, you know, our channel, we don't get paid for reviews. We don't get any of that. Nope. So, you know, everything I give you is my own personal opinion. I talk about that with LMT because I have a lot of intimate knowledge with the company. I've worked for the company um, doing manuals. I've done consulting. I know a lot of the insides of this of this year. And um, with all the trigger time I've got on them, this is my go-to gun. And I've given you guys tons of the reasons why I feel that way. So, you know, Carl, he certainly is a good friend of mine. But again, there's no business relationship between the two of us. Um, as you see, uh, there's no product codes or anything. You know, I, I, don't, I don't get any kickback from what you guys buy. I'm just telling you what I think is the best gear that's out there. And I own a shit ton of it. And that's the reason why, because that is the stuff that I trust. And for me, running the business on my side of things, we only have product codes for 
was it three companies now? Manta, uh, G96, and Centurion, and that's it. Because these are products that he's used literally for his entirety yeah. of his career yeah. in, in firearms, um, except Centurion. But that's something that he stands behind. A well, thousand Centurion percent. goes back at least uh, 10 years as well. This channel is built on nothing but his reputation. And that's why we laughed with the company who wanted the video for, yeah. they wanted it. They, they wanted to use it from, they wanted the, the actual hard copy yes. of my video. And I had a conversation with them that basically was like, um, hell no. <laughs> um, that makes it look like you've sponsored us and you paid us and, and, and we borrowed a gun and that is being returned. And, yeah no, you can't have a hard copy of, of the free marketing that you got from it. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, if they wanted, if they wanted to, 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 you know, to pay for that, we, they certainly could have, we would have done that because the video was already done. There was, this was done after the fact, but uh, as I said, you know, they don't want it. You know, if we, they won't give us links to our channel that where we at least get the views on it. They wanted it solely. So we would get nothing. And it's like, wow, I don't know what marketing school. He was at the top of his freaking class. That's for damn sure. Are we at the very limits of the AR-15 platform design? It's continuing to evolve. Um, it's continuing to evolve to new to new calibers, new capabilities, uh, barrel changes and whatnot, um, new gas systems, new optics. It's continuing to evolve. Um, there is no rifle in history, no small arm in history that has the modularity of this platform, and it's not going anywhere. It's still it's still being done today. It's the largest. Most popular, it's the most popular firearm in America today. More errors are made than any other family of weapons, and uh, it's no, it's still evolving. The story still continues. Is the Springfield Armory XDM? Oh, it just jumped. Um, XDM Elite, a good, trustworthy home defense gun. Certainly. Um, you know the original XDs. I, I remember when the rifle and the pistols came in from um, from Croatia. Um, it was only a short period of time before. They got they got to deal with uh, Springfield and start making EXDs, and those Croatian pistols were excellent. Uh, they were reliable. They for the guy who, uh, you know, they didn't like the Glock safe action. They wanted to have, a, you know, another kind of safety with the grip safety. It, it offered that. Um, I don't have any any contacts at Springfield, so that's why you've never seen me do any reviews on any of the XDs. Uh, I really like to get my hands on one of the original Croatia ones to be honest with you to do a video on. But uh, no, those are excellent pistols, military grade pistols. In fact, uh, I was in Czech, the Czech Republic uh, maybe three years ago, and a company uh, who manufactured H HKS or I think remember the name of the company. It'll come to me, I'm sure, tonight when I'm asleep. Um, you know, they're selling to the Czech military, to Slovakia, uh, law enforcement throughout the Czech Republic. It's a military grade weapon. Uh, so you can certainly feel very comfortable with that as a self defense weapon. Absolutely. Uh, Miles wants to know Have you ever heard of the Evolution Weapon System? They make what they call a bufferless BCG, which essentially looks like a SIG MCX BCG made for a DIAR. Hmm. Can't say as I know that one. He says he can send me the link to it if you're interested. I'm always interested in new things. Well, Miles, if you want to forward it over to me, I'll, I'll give it a look. Uh, Matt, thank you. I own several AKs. I'm looking to get one and only one general purpose AR-15 of decent quality. What would you recommend? Again, looking at what kind of money you're looking to spend. Um, there's a lot of good ones out there. Um, he said one general purpose. One general decent purpose. Decent quality. Decent quality. Um, for probably around twelve or fourteen hundred bucks, uh, you have the, the Centurion lightweight. Uh, that rifle has a uh, cold hammer forged barrel. It's a basic rifle, but it's one that you would be able to depend on uh, for anything that you would need. Uh, that's really a good rifle. You can certainly look at some of the arrow precision type rifles that are that are less expensive. Um, but if you're only going to buy one, I definitely wouldn't go with the lowest end, and I wouldn't go with the highest end. I think there's a lot of those mid mid level ones. Uh, the Centurion certainly is one I would look at for that. Uh, Colt 6920s, if you can find them, that's a reasonable price. Of course, the LMT uh, systems as well. They have their uh, their standard rifles that are on MRPs, which are still looking around 12 to 1400 in that, in that area. But uh, if you're looking for just one and you want it to be a, something that you can depend on, those mid-levels those mid are, are a lot better way to go. 
Matthew, best M4A1 replica for off-duty shooting and training? Well, uh, when you refer to M4A1, you're generally probably referring to the SOCOM barrel. Uh, for as far as SOCOM barrels are concerned, uh, Colt was the only one who really produced that, and that was uh, their, their SOCOM LE 6920, which I don't believe is, is any longer in production, or at least not in production at the moment. But it's funny that you should mention that, because just yesterday, uh, Monty, that's in Train Arms, uh, posted photographs of SOCOM barrels, 14-inch barrels that he just got in, Colt Hammer Forged Chrome Line barrels. So if you were looking for something in the, in the M4A1 SOCOM, uh, I would take a look at Centurion because he is probably the first one I've seen uh, in God knows how long who's making a true M4A1 barrel. And he's doing, he's doing it one better. It's, it's Colt Hammer Forged. The Colt barrels, uh, the SoCal barrels, were not Colt Hammer Forged. They were standard chrome molly vanadium steel. Uh, the ones that Monty's putting out are basically like the FN barrels, but they're, it's an actual SoCal barrel, which you're, you're talking about here. Adnan on Donor Box. Thank you, Adnan. Um, he has a couple questions. His first question is, what are your thoughts on the Sons of Liberty Gunworks that the owner doesn't believe in using the O-rings for the bolt extractor uh, developed by Crane? They utilized the Springco 5 coal coil extra power extractor spring instead. Read about it in an article by AR Junkie. Well, there's some reality here and there's some physics here. If you look at the size of the compartment uh, in the extractor between the extractor and the bolt, you only have so much space in there. Uh, Colt, with the introduction of the M4A1 and the gold spring, basically made a, the spring as long as you can possibly make it. So you already have an extended spring there. Now, by putting the rubber O-ring around that spring, you still have that, you're still in that compartment. So you're adding about four times the extraction force to it on top of the improved spring with the rubber O-ring. So unless this guy, I don't know who he is, unless he's trying to pedal something of his own, I think he's full of it. Um, using a, using the gold extractor spring of the Colt M4A1 and that rubber O-ring, there's nothing out there that's better unless you're going to go with like an LMT dual spring uh, extractor. Um, that really is the only thing I think that trumps uh, the, is the modified, like the LMT and the, and the Knights, where they have a very modified, a much more aggressive, stronger uh, extractor with dual springs. And his second question is about the Sig Sauer MCX Virtus. I noticed one of the design changes that was made to the carrier was that they added a firing pin safety is sort of similar to the HK416-417 design where they're carriers. Does the new Sig MCX Virtus or the previous models have an issue of being overgassed? No. Um, what happened was uh, right around the time the Virtus was coming out, um, there was a customer, well, actually it was in-house, uh, 300 Blackout. There was a specific kind of ammunition that I'm not allowed to say because uh, the guy I talked to at SIG told me I couldn't. They were experiencing slam fires uh, because of the ammunition with the primers. And due to the fact that it was a very common ammunition, uh, SIG decided they were going to uh, be proactive and put a firing pin safety on there to prevent the possibility of slam fires on this particular kind of ammunition because they can't, you know, the so SIG can't, uh, they, they can't tell you what ammunition you can and can't put into the gun. This was an ammunition related problem. It was not a gun related problem. And SIG wanted to be sure that uh, there would be no accidents because of this. So they had added that, but it was uh, not because of the five, five, six is because of the 300 blackout and because the guns are universal. Uh, you're just changing out the barrels. They put it across the board. Uh, that was not uh, like the HK416. That was done because of slam fires due to the excessive cyclic rate. This was not. This was due to primary sensitivity on this one major manufacturer's ammunition. Eric wants to know what future do you see for the Sig P226 and P220 in light of the new Sig models of handguns? I see it basically being bygone. You know, um, the P226 and the P220 series were the guns of the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. Uh, after 2010 with the, you know, we're starting to look at the, the change over to the M17. It's the death of one generation, uh, and the birth of a new. Now I don't ever see them stopping producing the T26 and the 220 series because that is still their staple. Um, it's days for military service. I think are pretty much done. It's days for law enforcement service. I pretty much think it's done because what we're seeing is, uh, lightweight polymer frame striker fire pistols that's what all the requirements are coming in for uh whether it be a, a you know special operations from around the world or whether it be regular military um it's sort of like the you know torch has been passed from you know a double single action to striker uh, so I, I again i never see those going to be looking at a production they're too popular they're uh they're legendary the 226 is legendary 
Um, you have a lot of guys who are former so SOCOM guys, uh, police officers. That was their duty gun, uh, and they'll, they will swear by those forever. Um, but as far as future military sales, you know, at that times, I think at times past. I think she's hunting for uh, trolls. No, I'm not. Oh. <laughs> I have to go through some conversations first. I can never do this without her. Uh, BFA on mid-length PSA upper. Any concerns with firing blanks, then firing live ammo without cleaning prior to firing live and having reliability issues? You always want to clean with blanks. Blanks are significantly uh, filthier than live ammunition. Uh, the propellant used in blanks is more of a black powder than it is a standard uh, propellant. It burns a lot filthier. I would highly recommend that anytime you fire blanks that you clean before you fire live rounds. As far as the safety of it is concerned, I wouldn't know because... Uh, you know, when I was in the army, we used blanks a lot back in the you know the early nineties. Um, we always cleaned those guns before we switched from blanks to live ammo. It was I never never would have had the opportunity to to test that theory, but uh, just due to the fact that that stuff is filthy, you absolutely want to make sure that you clean it before you fire live rounds. What was the M sixteen A four round count before failure compared to that of the Demaco Colt Canada LSW? Where's where's that one at? Let me read that. It's right there. Well, the LSW was a was a was a extremely heavy barrel meant for sustained fire. It's a totally different kind of a barrel. Uh, the M sixteen A four was a standard rifle barrel, uh, and the LSW was uh, was an extreme heavy barrel. So, uh, as far as what those round counts would be, oddly enough, um, over the last you know twenty years. You know, since the uh, since global war on terror, very little work has been done on the M16A2 way four rifles. It's all been done on the carbines, and I can't even say that I can remember uh, it, Colt or anywhere doing any testing on the 20 inch barrels. It's always been on the 14 and a half and 16 and and, and lower. So, so for as far as those round counts, I, I couldn't say. I'll say is the the Colt LMG and the uh, the IAR. Those things are run uh, well over. Oh God. I think without without there were near over a thousand rounds. I think before they had any problems with thermal failure on the bolts, because uh, that's really what would what would fail on those. This is an interesting question. Um, his name is some guy. Um, he wants to know what the future for you in is in the firearms industry and for small arms solutions, um, consulting, building your own arms company. Where's that question? At? <laughs> right there. I think that the, the, the future, uh, I don't, I don't see Chris really building an arms company. No. Uh, I know that it's, you know, a concept that, that that's been toyed around with in the past. I think the closest we would ever get to that is um, working on a build class with parts that are more um, tapered towards like the boutique guns that he likes to build with the parts that he believes are the best. We looked into that. We even got some prices yeah, together. Because his armor schools that he's done in the plant, and I, 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 we do regularly get that question. You know, before before YouTube was YouTube, um, uh, Small Arm Solutions was, was our business. And it was a business we started, you know, long before, you know, we had YouTube channel. And um, one of those things that we did was armor schools. And, um, but it's, it's, it's a dip, it's a different atmosphere now that's um, with the channel because the people that are interested in one of his armor schools are not really interested in being certified um, to go into a court of law to say, I am a certified armor and I can speak on this or repair guns and armor armory. Um, they want to talk to Chris and they want to ask questions. And so instead of a four day intensive class that he you know spends a lot of time in putting together um the one time we tried it it didn't really work out because um you know youtube fans are different than police, police officers yeah, that could really give a yeah. shit <laughs> you know yeah. they they're like they know that he's chris bartacci he's written this this book he's been in publications but yeah, like above and beyond that they don't really care it's no, they not, just need to get their certification for they're the not department. they're not they're not asking for questions or uh, no. asking questions or getting photos you know yeah. um or wanting to go to dinner so um that's as close as we've looked as far as like putting together some kind of um build class that would be tapered to more of the audience a small arm solutions youtube wise um with one of his boutique rifles that he puts together and with the components that he believes in because you know the, the, this youtube thing right now you know is really 
you tend to feel like you're always in Brown Tomatoes. I had a long conversation uh, last night with Tim Harmison going on Mac, you know, talking about, you know, how you are, are envisioning in the future of YouTube. And, you know, I think we both really feel as though at some point this hammer is going to come down. They're going to go after all gun channels. And it's going to be unilateral uh, blocking of gun channels. And if that's that's the only point where we're, there's somebody's going to be able to develop a platform where if you want to know about guns, you're going to have to go somewhere else. So YouTube won't be an option any longer. Um, I think until that happens, you know, we're all just waiting for that hammer to drop. I don't look at it like that um, uh, from being on the business side of things. Yeah, um, she, she, we have two different perspectives. I'm, I'm the guy you're seeing in front of here. She's the brains behind it. Um, Chris is not tech, <laughs> tech savvy. Yeah. That's why I laugh at the beginning when you said something like the, the web page. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Because <laughs> he doesn't know. And, you know, when we, I talk about Instagram, he kind of glazes over. He's like, what? What's that? I look um, at Facebook. I don't go on Instagram. Chris is, Chris is the tech guy. He's, he's the technical. He's the brains. And I just take his, his brains and I put it, put it out to the masses and, and, and gear it that way. Um, I, I believe you ha always have to be evolving and changing and growing and developing and, and behind the scenes over here. I'm definitely always thinking and going, and he may not, you know, love my ideas for, for like the crime series and things, but you know, um, she's usually right. There's other time I'm just stubborn. You know, he he he's very competitive in a lot of ways. Like I can remember wanting to do the video of who is Chris Bartachi. And he goes, nobody cares about that. I don't like talking about myself. <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like, well, it might be nice to be able to say, here's my resume in video form so that you know what you're getting is not just some guy who likes firearms and he buys stuff. And and that's great too. That's a hobby, but this is like his entire career and his life and like what he does. And in the back end, yes, he does do consulting and um, he still writes armor's manuals and, and things like that. I would like to do more things that are geared toward the channel, but you know, pandemic and all <laughs> but uh yeah i mean it's it's always growing and changing and um i don't look at it as uh, the hammer is about to drop and, and youtube is going to take it down i feel like we're always having to um or i'm always having to reinvent. dance around and reinvent and i've reinvented the wheel a few times uh i've even reinvented the entire channel before yeah so i'm more of an optimist that I can get around it. Life is all about challenges. And um, if it was easy, then we would all be successful and millionaires and all of this. But life is not easy. Life is challenging and running a business is challenging and just part of it. And yeah. Ah, marriage. Is what he said. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to uh, be married and work um, together. Yeah. But um, yeah. If you guys are getting along today, you're not going to get too much filming done. <laughs> 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 or there'll be situations where and you're looking across there in, in uh, you know, you're looking into the camera trying to talk and all of a sudden you're just giving you the Manson lamps. <laughs> it can be very distracting too. Or when he accidentally uh, a part flies, it was really wasn't an accident if it clocks mm -hmm. you on the side of the head. Sorry, we went a little in depth with that question. Let me go back up here to where I didn't miss anybody. We did Eric's. Uh, let's see. Okay, my LE6920 BCG locks to the rear after the last round, but occasionally it, I see my bolt a little forward. I'm told this happens from time to time, but why? Uh, if you have, if your ammunition that you're using is giving you a lower port pressure, it's knocking the bolt back at a slower velocity, and it's slow enough that the bolt catches the uh, carrier uh, instead of the bolt, or if it's too fast, that's another time that, that can happen. But generally that uh, is, is due to lower powered ammunition. You're blowing it back far enough where it's extracting and injecting, uh, but it's, it's just not far enough to catch on the bolt that catches on the carrier. That's probably your ammunition. And if it's doing it with high pressure ammunition, then you got a problem with your gas port. It's too small. It was funny. He said, Chris is the head and Heather is the neck, you know, cause the, the, you can turn the neck, whatever. Mm -hmm. but I would probably add to that, that I'm the head and the neck and the whole body. And I'm just the ass. <laughs> um, yeah, pretty much. Mm -hmm. But, and Sean says if he worked with his fiance, we would be on the ID channel for a mystery. Office. Mm -hmm. I think for the most part, like we're able to separate, like if there's problems, like you would never know in a Q and a we're yeah. able to, we're able to turn business on and, whether we hate each other. <laughs> mm 
Uh, Matt wants to know for both, what is our favorite summer adult beverage? Don't uh, say Diet Coke, Chris. That's so lame. Fine. Uh, I'm more, <laughs> more of a beer guy. He said adult beverage. Yeah, I'm, I'm more Because I know what guy. he's going to say. So, you know, maybe some of my Lone Star or my, uh, my Molson Golden, Molson Canadian, or my, or my uh, Schlitz. God, Schlitz. Beer. You should see him when he goes into um, – a Texas liquor store and ask for Schlitz. I, they, they literally like turn their head like, they're like, really? Like seriously? And then they have to go ask somebody and they're like, we might have like an old box in the back. Before I moved to Texas, we had a place in New York. It was called Beers of the World in Rochester. Um, I, I've been to over about 30 countries in, in my career and uh, I've had beer all over the world. And I've had a couple of them that tend to be my favorites. And one of my favorites is uh, it was out of Thailand called Singha. And uh, I would always buy, you know, like a case of Singha and have that. And it's a little harder to come by here. I had Cristal, which is one I had. And then there was uh, Carlsbad out of Denmark I loved. Uh, and then, of course, I was in Jamaica a couple of times and actually got to go through the uh, factory for a red stripe. I like that, too. But uh, I haven't been able to find a lot of those kinds of stores here yet. Um, but I tend to like my, you know, the good old-fashioned, you know, Schlitz. And, of course, growing up north, the Canadian beer, up on the, you know, the Molson Golden, Molson Canadian. Well, as most people know that I love wine, but I don't like to drink wine when it's hot and nasty outside. But I love a good gin and tonic. Um, rosé. Rosé, you know. I'm a, a basic white girl. Then she also makes sangrias, too. I haven't done that in a while, but yeah. Um, anonymous. What's the best BC BCG for a 10.5? I heard LMT enhanced BCG isn't good for a 10.5 because of length and dwell time. The carrier, no, the bolt, yes. Uh, for as far as the carrier is concerned, you know, any good mill spec type carrier, um, you don't have to spend a lot of money. You could go, you know, Centurion, get one of those, get, get your Colt. Uh, because even, you know, the Colt was, even though they're not made by Colt anymore, for the most part, they they do have to pass their, their quality control inspections. So you're looking at that. Um, if you want to go a little bit extra, I would take a look at the, uh, you know, the POF or the LWRC. Uh, with the with the steel uh, carrier key, uh, those are certainly enhancements as well. But for any of those shorter barrels where you're looking at a higher rate of fire, the enhanced bolt would definitely be a major uh, benefit because you have a much stronger extraction and you also have a stronger material, and you have the stress relief on the lugs uh, for dealing with that higher rate of fire. I love Drew. Drew said a Long Island iced tea and a McRib. That I do like. I'm Long Island iced tea fan. He used to he used to have Long Island iced teas back in the day. It's so hard for someone who could actually make them right though. Back in the day, when you would like have a drink, and now when somebody asks about adult beverages, you're like, "Oh, I love a good Diet Coke." Mm, that's enough. <laughs> Matthew on DonorBox. Thank you, Matthew. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for all of your great info. I have a question about overgassing. I'm using a 16-inch mid-length FN hammer forged barrel with a standard carbine spring and an H buffer. When shooting XM193, my ejection pattern is about 2 o'clock. I put in an H3 buffer with a red spring co spring and now can get the eje ejection pattern to the optimal 3.30 to 4 o'clock. Bolt locks mm -hmm. open after last round fired and no malfunctions observed after 100 rounds. Would you recommend keeping this configuration or will this ultimately cause more problems uh, down the road? Absolutely not. Uh, get that H3 buffer out of there. The only time you should be using an H3 buffer is if you have an extremely heavy barrel. Here's what the issue is. Because many people insist on using Wolf and cheap ammunition that does not adhere to SAMI uh, or NATO type standards, it's extremely low on the, on the pressure. So many people will say that they judge the gun's quality on whether it will work with that crap ammo. Well, if you want to make the guns work with that crap ammo, you have to open up the, the gas ports. Where if you're using regular 5.56 ammo, you'll be able to stick with the proper gas port and things will be fine. But these manufacturers now have to compensate to, to, uh, to make these guns work with horrible ammunition, horribly underpowered ammunition. And the unfortunate consequence with that is you get overgassing with, uh, with proper ammunition. Um, the A three buffer, you, you do not want that. If, you're, if your ejection patterns is at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, leave it alone. Um, you are using the proper buffer and everything that goes along with it. But this is the consequence for the most part of uh, people insisting on using crap ammunition uh, in good guns. This isn't a problem for the military. Because the military, you have 5.56 NATO, and you have a complete specification for gas ports and all that stuff and report pressures. So you can make around it 
performs perfect. It, it's, 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 you know, you're, it's where it needs to be. Of course, you guess port erosion makes a big difference too with speeding things up, but you have only one variable. Well, if you look at a manufacturer today, how many different kinds of 5.56 ammunition are out there? And even, even NATO uh, specifications, the ammunition is not even the same. You'll see differences in pressures. So they have to open up these gas ports so you guys can fire your, your crap ammunition. Um, that's, that's the consequence uh, with, with the commercial grade guns versus the military ones. Um, Adam says, nobody go to my range till after 11 on Saturday, please. I haven't shot in a month or so. <laughs> There's everybody's going to be at the range, Adam. <laughs> everybody's going to celebrate America with some guns. That's what we do. We shoot and we barbecue. <laughs> so for those who look Yeah, pillage. Sean says 35% of YouTube videos that are watched in the USA have to do with guns and outdoors. I believe you, Sean. That's why I don't think that YouTube would kick out that community. I hope not. I just think they that they more fair to us, I wish continually make it harder but what is with the spec for firing pin protrusion on an ARBCG I can't it? recall it offhand but we there's a no a no go gauge um, if you look if you have an armor's manual or my armor's manual or any armor's manual um, it's made properly you'll be able to see what the actual uh, measurements are uh, there is a tool that you can get through Brownells uh, or through a couple other companies. You know, a couple of companies. Uh, LMT makes them as well. Um, it's basically a gauge that uh, you have a go and a no go. If it's a no go, uh, your gauge is uh, touching the firing pin. If it's a no go, it's not. Um, that's something that uh, your average person is not really going to have to worry about. Uh, there's a really they, they do a very good job uh, at, the, at the manufacturers with these on, on new guns, but. Uh, Anybody who's done work on multiple numbers, you know, multiple guns, it's a good thing to have. But uh, you can certainly find that out easy on the internet. And if you look at my armor's manual, information's in there as well. There's big photographs that show all that. How would one reach your level of expertise getting into the industry today? Dude, I, I, I have no idea. Um, a lot of stuff in this industry is not about how good you are. It's who you know, um, to be honest with you. Um, a lot of people get jobs that are they're not qualified for. Unfortunately, uh, it's this this industry is very very difficult. Um, I uh, you know this is the only industry I know, but I can tell you the the turnover rate is unbelievable. You you know if you go to shot show and you get business cards, and in six months you go to call those people uh, that you get their business cards, they've moved on to someplace else. Um, for as far as my level of knowledge you're looking at somebody who's been doing this since they were 10 years old and that's all I've ever done. Uh, I've never had any hobbies outside of this. I never watched football or baseball or did any of that kind of stuff. This is all I do uh, in one way or another. It's all I've ever done. So uh, it's more of a lifestyle than it is just a hobby. Uh, it's been my profession. It's been my, uh, my hobby. It's, it's just all I've ever done. I've been able to work in the industry, whether it be in law enforcement or military uh, forensics, whatever I've had those opportunities. Um, to break into the industry right now, uh, a lot of people wouldn't want to uh, because it's not stable. Um, the industry is having a hard time finding uh, engineers right now because uh, a lot of engineers is are, are coming out of school. Obviously, there's no school that you go to for making guns. You know, basically, you would get the uh, you would say, "Hey, that's what I want to do." You go to work for a gun manufacturer and you would get your training there. And a lot of people are afraid to make those chances or take those chances of getting those jobs right now because of the instability. So um, I think a lot of people are more nervous about getting into the business. My wife's shaking her head. I just literally cringe every time somebody asks that question. Yeah. And I, I know that you're going to go on this spiel because as you can see, it's a good thing that Chris knows a lot about firearms because clearly he's not meant to be a motivational speaker no. and someone who's optimistic about things. No, I, used to, I, told, I tell you, my experience was and how I see it. And I agree that what he does is a lifestyle. It is not a profession. It is what he eats, breathes, and sleeps. I believe that you start as soon as you can and you have to have a passion for it, whether whatever it is, you have to consume knowledge and just continue to consume knowledge and from all places um, and never feel like, you know, oh, no. the most or the best Learn or every day you just keep consuming knowledge. And um, yes, the industry is always changing and he's right. There's people that move on. Um, 
I've, I've seen it myself at shot shows and one person's working one booth and then the next one they're working at somebody else's booth. Hell, they might even change midweek to somebody else's booth. But, you know, the, the industry is changing. It's always changing. Is it stable? I don't believe the industry has ever been stable. So you kind of have to go into it knowing that you may be bouncing around, but it's also opportunity to consume more, more knowledge from different places. And with years and time doing that is when you'll be able to get to that level where you start to feel like you're starting to know your stuff. If you're looking at you know going to work for one place and staying there for 20, 30 years, those it seems like those days are mostly over. Um, you just see that constant that constant turnover. Companies reinventing themselves, doing reorganizations, um, especially in an industry that's driven by uh, the demand, and that demand's often conflict. It's war. Um, these industries tend to uh, do a lot better when this country is at war. And either stay single or find somebody who's going to be able to support your dream to be able to go to different places and do different things. Um, why can't uh, s and make a gun that passes military tests? No idea. It's just, it has been the, since they stopped selling the revolvers, since the revolvers no longer being produced, ever since they got into the uh, semi-automatic pistol market, they have not been able to get it together. Um, the guns, uh, you know, for the most part, if you look at the semi-automatic pistols that they had, uh, for law enforcement, the 59 series, 69 series, they weren't redesigning those things. They were just modifying them. Uh, they were staying with the same designs, but with slight modifications, and they were not good designs for that kind of a use. And then, of course, comes uh, Smith & Wesson going into Striker. Here they copy the Glock. They get their ass sued. Uh, they had to uh, reinvent their Striker fire gun. Here comes the M&P. Uh, the M&P was a decent pistol. It uh it did serve law enforcement decently, uh, but it was never military grade. Um, and they still were never able to touch Glock's market share because the guns were never as durable and as reliable as they were. It's just, uh, for some reason, it's a curse they've had with some automatic pistols. Uh, that's really all I can say. You know, their revolvers were great. It just was, uh, they've just never been able to get that durability and reliability down to the point where uh, the guns could make uh, military testing. Mike, um, who referred to you as a douche for talking about Black Hills. Mike, a grown man your age with that profile picture using that amount of emojis. Um, yeah. So Mr. Mike, he, he didn't approve of Black Hills ammunition? He is, yeah. He's, <laughs> he's having a hard day. Yeah. Mike, <laughs> we love you. You're blocked, but bye. Uh, Patrick, thoughts on the, uh, the six millimeter ARC? You did answer that in the very beginning. Yeah, I, I know I, somebody I, else wanted that question asked too. Any plans to get to test one? Apologies, you covered this. Yes. Um, again, I have ammunition on order right now from Hornady. Uh, it's a little hard to come by right now. And I've been talking with a gentleman over at CMMG who was there in the process of building a rifle. And uh, I talked to Carl Lewis a couple days ago and asked him what his thoughts were. He basically told me to stand by, which generally means that uh, they are working on, a, on an MRP barrel as well, which that's the truly one I'll be waiting for. But uh, you can certainly rest assured as soon as I can get both gun and ammo in hand, you will see a video on it. It looks very interesting and it looks very promising, especially considering all the cartridges that have come and gone in the last couple of years. Are you planning on doing any videos on the pistol length gas system? No, I, I, I don't believe in them. Uh, unless you're, unless you're doing a pistol length system in a 300 blackout, uh, which is what it's designed for. If you want to, if you want to shoot the subsonic uh, without a suppressor, um, that is an absolute horrible idea for a five, five, six or any other uh, caliber of the such. Um, I would not recommend that for any kind of uh, self-defense or for any kind of uh, military or law enforcement use. Um, I am strongly opposed to it. Let me just say that. Um, external piston systems, there are some decent ones. But again, uh, you're looking at a rifle cartridge. You're losing so much velocity and you're getting so much of a fireball. I, I don't see the purpose of it. But it's not something that I would ever recommend anybody do for any kind of real world use. Is 5.56 five, really as poor for self-defense as a lot of people make it out to be? No, a lot of people have no idea what they're talking about. 
the 556 is responsible for the death of an awful lot of folks over the last 60 years. It works quite well. A lot of the problems come down to is perception. Uh, people will say, well, yeah, you can't even hunt a deer with it. You know, how you need to use people? People tend to realize that uh, the human body is very different from a deer. Um, dumping a, a small caliber, dumping a lot of energy and a lot of hydrostatic shock does a lot of damage. Uh, and the bullets between the yaw and the fragmentation create much more devastating wounds than a lot of these higher caliber bullets. Um, in my career in forensics and also my experience overseas, and I've seen my fair share of wounds. There are a lot of wounds that are survivable because they were AK-47s. If they would have been uh, five, five, sixes, the person probably would have been dead. Um, any of you guys who uh, do some research and look at what uh, some of the combat uh, surgeons have to say, um, it's all pretty much universal. What they say is that the wounds from the small caliber high velocity rounds are far more devastating than those of the larger calibers. Uh, for the most part, a 7.62 NATO or, or 7.62 by 39, those full metal jacket bolts are going to blow right through. They're going to make a hole and go right through. Um, the 5.56s, they'll go in maybe a couple inches, they'll yaw, they'll fracture at the cantaloupe. So not only are you getting a massive hydrostatic shock, but you're creating multiple wounds uh, from that projectile. So uh, a lot of that is based on people who have no idea what they're talking about. Um, I would highly recommend you start, you look at some of the, uh, you know, some military surgeons and take a look at some of those x-rays, uh, some of those wounds for yourselves. And you will see uh, that the, it's not necessarily what these people seem to think. There's a reason why we're still using it after all of these years. And there's a reason why this is called the black rifle. Those of you who don't know where the term black rifle came from, that came from the Viet Cong and the NVA because they saw the wounds that these new rifles were creating and they were terrified of them. So they would say, beware of the man with a black rifle because they were terrified of the wounds. And you go back to Afghanistan with the introduction of the AK-74, the Mujahideen were quite scared of the new AK-74. They called that the stinging, I forget what they called the stinging or poison type bullet because it created massive wounds compared to the AK-47 because of the way it would tumble and, and, and the tissue destruction that it would do. Matthew um, has a follow-up question. He's the one with the H3 buffer. Mm -hmm. Uh, will it cause damage to components in the rifle, or is it more of a re reliability and cycling issue? When he also forgot to add that I uh, not shoot under powered ammo. Usually put XM193 down range if that makes any difference. The rifle could be definitely compromised in different weather conditions. Uh, once you get into uh, colder weather, uh, where your powder gives you gives you less of a, uh, a poor pressure, you can you can have short stroking. Um, your system was designed by the manufacturer to work under certain parameters. Uh, when you start changing those parameters, for instance, a system would consist of a gas tube, a gas, you know, a barrel length, a port pressure, a gas port diameter, buffer, buffer spring. All that works as a system uh, for it to work reliably in any condition, and whether it be negative 60 or, or 160, um, it will work on, in any environment with standard military grade ammunition. You start modifying those with a specifically with a heavier buffer, you're creating more resistance. Uh, so you're going to be needing additional gas pressure to work that back like it's supposed to. If you were to try firing that on fully automatic, you would see a massively slow uh, cyclic rate. My guess is you would be below 600 rounds a minute, which means that's below the uh, 750 to uh, 950 rounds a minute that you would have for a mil spec, which would mean that rifle's uh, chances of functioning in cold weather would be very, very uh, slim. Um, I would highly recommend you stick with an H in there. Uh, you know, an H2 would be even, even be pushing it. Uh, H2 normally is only if you have a uh, heavy barrel, but I would rather see you have an H2 in there than I would an H3. H3s do not belong. Uh, that is, the H3 is primarily designed for 308s. It's not designed for 556s. In fact, Colt has only had one gun in their history. They ever used an H3, and that was the IAR, because the IAR was a massively heavy barrel. Who makes a good BCG for a six millimeter ARC currently? We don't know because it's brand new. Um, there are very few rifles that are available uh, yet in that caliber, and it's not mainstream. The ammunition still is a little bit. So I don't think there's enough information available at this moment to be able to tell you that. You know, give, give it six months uh, where uh, some manufacturers get a chance to build these guns. They get out there and people get testing them, and they start seeing how these guns hold up. Well, I think we're going to close it down for the night. Thank you guys for joining us. If you have questions um, outside of the Q&A, you um, are more than welcome to uh, email me th with them. We just ask that you make a donation in any amount to the channel using the donor box links that are on smallarmsolutions.com. You can email me separately or you can put it in the comment section and you can include any photos if you have uh, anything you need um, identified or you're having a problem. We do all of that seven days a week. So 
Uh, we hope you guys have a really good 4th of July and stay safe. Hopefully you'll enjoy stay our well. new train video. Yep, that will be up. I will be editing that <laughs> a good 12 hours tomorrow. So good night, guys. Good night. Oh, I got this.